Good morning. Welcome to worship from Bisco Presbyterian Church. Somebody commented you all got here early and you were quiet. What was wrong? <laughs> you all were really, really quiet and subdued this morning, but I'm glad you're here. Glad to welcome those who are joining us in the fellowship hall and those who are live streaming this morning. Welcome to all of you. Special welcome to Judy Burris. Judy's sitting right down here. She's our COM liaison. She'll be meeting with a session later. Uh, she's a retired school teacher from Jackson Springs, so I told her she'd be right at home with us this morning and glad that Judy's here. Glad to welcome those uh, who are in Michaela's family, Avery's family, I guess I should say, because I know some of you and that I know some of you are visiting. We're glad you're here and to all of us. Uh, those of you who know the Lord Jesus, you're at home and you join in and worship with us as we worship this morning. If you'll turn in the announcements in your bulletin, just to highlight these this morning, we are observing the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper this morning. Session meets this afternoon at 2 in the Fellowship Hall and wedding this week. Don't forget to be in prayer. And uh, Morgan and Devin said they're still committed. So <laughs> <coughs> they, they are going to see this thing through. And I'm tickled to death for them. And you just be praying for them that this will be a time of blessing for them and for everyone who comes. Men of the Church, breakfast next Sunday at 8 in the Fellowship Hall. You notice the announcement about the annual bazaar and bake sale for the Presbyterian women. That's Saturday, December the 4th. All the details about that are there. All these things are important and they're good, but nothing more important than what we do now, and that's worship. So let's turn our thoughts away from all those things, good as they are, that would distract us. Let us think on the Lord Jesus and let's worship together. Hear the words of the psalmist. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Let's continue our worship this morning. I guess I better pray first. Uh, we will get through it, I promise. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've called us together. Thank you that you have set aside this special morning that we can worship not only through singing and preaching and praying and giving, but also in the observance of the sacraments. Thank you for your love and faithfulness. Thank you 
for Jesus who lived and died and rose again that we might have life eternal. Thank you that your Holy Spirit dwells within your people individually and as a church so that, Lord, you're here with us. And we pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts that will obey, minds that will receive, so that in all these things we would hear your word. We would praise your name. And that when we leave this place, we would not be the same as when we entered. But we would know that we've been in the presence of the great king. Now teach us to pray. As Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's join our voices in worship, turning in our hymnals to hymn number 324. Hymn number 324, let's stand as we sing, I Need Thee Every Hour. As we come to the sacrament of baptism, we remember the scriptures that tell us that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. The scripture says, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Baptism is a covenant sign, a covenant sign of our cleansing from sin, of our relationship with Christ, and our belonging to God's people. All this is ours because of God's grace to us. We haven't earned it. 
Uh, we don't work for it. We don't pay a price and uh, some church official signs a paper and so we get it. It's ours because of God's provision through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we receive this by grace. Uh, one of the things when I was studying infant baptism and being raised a Baptist, that was the, the hardest uh, thing to come to, was reading one of the old reformers who said that the time of the application of the reality is not tied to the time of the application of the sign. So we, by faith, apply the sign knowing that God the Holy Spirit will make it alive and real in his own time. I still pray that for my daughter. Pray that for others in this church who uh, have wandered away from what they were taught, but they still bear in their bodies the sign. And we look to God and say, Lord, in your time, in your way, you make what was signed and sealed real in their hearts and bring them back to you. So we're not saying that this child is saved because we put this sign on him. The only way anyone is ever saved is by grace through faith in Christ. We know that. But this isn't an empty thing we do. Because we claim God's promise that to us and our children. And so I keep clinging to that. And there are times when I pray and say, Lord, you remember when? I remember your covenant promise. That's what we do today. It's an act of faith where we bring our children, we mark our children, and we make vows to one another and to God, but especially these parents, that they will raise this child in the fear and the admonition of the Lord so that he will know the right way, and so that he'll have to rebel against everything he knows in order to walk away because the most natural thing would be to walk in the paths of his parents and grandparents, those who've gone before him. As we come this morning, let's remember God's goodness to us. As I've told you many, many times and will tell you this one last time, every time God gives us a covenant child, it's a reminder that there's a future for the church. Here and hereafter. Boy, I'm glad it doesn't end with me. It didn't start with me. It doesn't end with me or you either. And God says, I have a future for my church. And when I hear these little ones around here, I say, oh, Lord, you have a good future. you got a bright future. There's hope. Let's be faithful in doing what we are getting ready to commit to do, to pray for, love, and instruct these children. All right. Christian, if you and Michaela bring Avery and...
If you'll turn in your Bibles to the prayer of confession, and let's stand together as we pray. Almighty God, who does freely pardon all who repent and turn to him, now fulfill in every contrite heart the promise of redeeming grace, forgiving all our sins and cleansing us from an evil conscience through the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Our salvation comes through Jesus, God's provision for us, and we receive it by faith. Not only at the time when we make our profession of faith, or we for the first time pray and receive Christ, but every day as we walk in fellowship with him. We claim his provision for us. We by faith keep looking to him. And we know that because he is faithful, that these words are true and his forgiveness is just as real today as the day we first asked for forgiveness. Oh, how good that our God is a forgiving God. Gracious, loves, delights to forgive his children and restore fellowship with them that we might faithfully walk with him day by day. Thanks be unto God, for he is a God who is faithful to forgive his children. Let's affirm our faith this morning using the Apostles' Creed, and you'll find a copy of that creed on page 12 of your hymnal. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. <coughs> Let's pray together. Father, once again, we gather around your throne, praising you, adoring you, giving you all honor and praise and glory, for you alone are God and you alone are worthy of such. We acknowledge that you are the great King, you're our king, you're our creator, you are God alone, and we praise you. But you're not only the almighty God, you have redeemed us and adopted us so that we call you father. And so you pick us up and sit us in your lap and let us bear our hearts to you. Not because you don't know, but because we need to tell you what's on our hearts. We need you. And so in this time, we come thanking you that we can snuggle in your lap. We can tell you what's on our hearts knowing that you already have in motion your means of answering our prayers. Thank you for loving us so. When we think of Jesus, we thank you for loving us so. 
when we see your church where we sit this morning and know these people and have worked together and laughed together and cried together, we thank you for loving us so that you put us in your church. We thank you for loving us so that when we're on the mountaintop, you were there, and when we are in the lowest valley of despond, you were there. When our bodies are hurting and aching, you were there, and when we are exhilarated, you are there. Father, you know what makes us afraid. You know what causes us to worry and fret. Lord, you know what breaks our hearts and you know what keeps us awake at night. Meet us there. Draw us to yourself and may your presence always be enough. Remind us of the words of the psalmist, what time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. The words of the wise man, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run to it and are safe. Oh God, teach us to ever run to you. For you don't cast your children away. You open your arms and welcome them. Say, it's safe, it's okay. I pray you would teach us to delight in your presence. So that regardless of our circumstances, we would just delight to be in your presence. To know that we walk with you. And we walk by faith, not by sight, because you know what we cannot see. And Lord, we thank you that you give us times like this morning when we can baptize little ones and know that you are smiling upon us. And we remember that Jesus loved the little ones. He would take them in his arms and bless them. And they loved being where he was. Lord, we're all little ones at heart. Thank you that you have taught us that you welcome little ones. So as your children, we come and say, speak to us. Speak to us through the preaching of your word. Speak to us through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Speak to us. And remind us that our redemption rests not on our ability to keep it, earn it, or be good enough. It rests in what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. And that's always more than enough. Continue to work your grace in us. Continue your good work in and through us, individually, as families, and as a church. And may we leave this place knowing that we have heard the word of God and we have been in the presence of God. And we would say, praise the name of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If the ushers will come, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings.
this, please. Holy Father, we thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you for all your blessings. We love you and we ask that you stand with us in our journey ahead. Bless these tithes and offerings and use them for your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> if you'll open your Bibles to Psalm 131. Psalm 131, you notice that it's a song of ascents and it's a psalm that's ascribed to David. It was sung by the people as they went up to Jerusalem for the holy festivals. Uh, and I wonder what it was like to hear the singing in the distance as the pilgrims would be passing through on their way to Jerusalem. Eugene Peterson in his book, Living the Message, states that busyness is an illusion of the spirit. A rush from one thing to another because there is no ballast of vocational integrity and no confidence in the primacy of grace. While he was speaking primarily to pastors, the truths he addresses speak to all of us. Through the years when I have asked people how they are, the most common response I've gotten after just fine is busy preacher, just busy. The most common response I've given is busy, busy. That is acceptable in our culture. It's even lauded that if you're busy, there must be some virtue in it. We're busy people. But the Lord's Supper calls us from our busyness to experience the peace of God. The peace of God that's ours because of Christ. So look at Psalm 100. 31, this is the word of God. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. The psalmist gives us images of this peace and then an exhortation. In verse 1, we see that in the presence of Christ, those things that are driving us are absent. What is it that drives you? It's interesting that uh, Jewish shepherds lead their sheep. They never drive them. And yet sometimes... The pastors I know especially and some of the Christians I've known are the most driven people on the planet. Sometimes I could be the poster child for that. What is it that drives you? What is it that you have to be doing all the time? Well, I always think it's my sense of self-worth. If I'm not doing something, I must be lazy. I've got to be doing something. You can't just sit and be still. And the only time I was ever told to be still was when I was aggravating my parents, usually in church. Be still. Uh, when's the last time you were still? Just still. Uh, not thinking all the things on your to-do list, not... I mean, I, sometimes the hardest place to be still is in church because you get still for a second and your mind just overloads with what you've got to do when you get out of here tomorrow, this week. But in the presence of Christ, those things that drive us are absent. The pride, the arrogance, the ambition. And notice the psalmist said, my heart's not proud. My eyes are not haughty. Lord, this isn't about me and what I've done. You see, they're going up to Jerusalem to worship, to bring tithes and offerings, to do all the things that were prescribed for them. And they said, Lord, you've been good to us. We're your people. Out of all the peoples of the earth, you've called us. And they were praising him. And the psalmist says, oh, I'm not proud. My eyes are not haughty. 
I don't concern myself with things that are too big for me above my pay grade. You know, I've heard people say, well, if I was president, and I want to go stop right there. If you were president, I'd be building a bunker. <clears throat> and somebody said, preacher, what would you do if you were president? I said, well, I hope I'd have a good sense to resign. And I said, I don't know anything about being president. <coughs> you see, sometimes we think if we could run the world, we would fix it. No. No, we wouldn't. We might find that we make a bigger mess than we ever intended. You see, the psalmist understood that there are just some things that God's not called me to. So let me be about the place and the business that God's called me to, for then I can have peace. Peterson continued, it's in the presence of Christ that we realize we get along not because we're good, but because we're forgiven. I spent my whole life trying to be good because I was told to be a good little boy. And when I wasn't, I felt on my backside the effects of that. So I always worked to be a good boy. Be a good boy. My grandmother would say, you granny's good boy, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. And when I wasn't, she had a switch to help me be her good boy. <laughs> you see, sometimes that's where we are. That we think if I can just be good enough for God, if I can just keep it together, you can't, you won't. That's why the scripture says God loved us and sent his son. To be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. He knew we couldn't be good enough. But he loved us and sent his son. And in him we have peace. That's why we come to this table realizing what God has done for us and instead of running away saying I'm not worthy, we say, Lord, we know we're not worthy. That's not the point. That's not what this table's about. It's about your worthiness and you get to decide who eats at your table. Uh, my dad was a provider. That was one of the things he was proud of that uh, he took care of his family. There was food on the table. And when you sat down at daddy's table, it was his table. If you didn't act the way he wanted you to act, you were dismissed from that table. If you didn't show proper respect, you were reminded whose table it was and how you were to act at that table. You see, this is the Lord's table. He decides who can come and eat. And the call of the Gospels, whosoever will, let him come. Why? Because God has paid the price in his own son. God has made the provision. And he says, you trust me. You're my child at your table. Come. And there we find peace. Not striving to prove we're good enough, but receiving his grace. Praising him for what he's done. The second image that the psalmist gives is that there is peace in the presence of God. He says, but I have calmed and quieted myself. Notice that. It's an act that he does. You remember the psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God? That's a command. Do it. Be still. My mother used to say, be still. And I wanted to say, I am trying, but it's not in me. And I remember uh, in college when I was taking Christian ed, we were doing Christian ed of children, that when we were learning about toddlers, the professor said, God put a wiggle in toddlers' tails, so understand they're going to move. So it's okay when toddlers are antsy. When 55-year-old men are antsy, you got a problem. And you know what? That was some of the greatest stuff he could have told us because I don't expect a two-year-old to act like a 25-year-old. And when I see them squirming and they're doing their world is alive to them, I say, thank you, Lord. 
I wish I had some of that wonder and wiggle now. You notice that here the psalmist says, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am what? Content. When we come to the Lord's table, the Lord says, quiet your heart. Be still in my presence. Be content with what I have put on the table. For it's enough. It's more than enough for what you need. Uh, when Avery was up here a minute ago, do you notice how he laid his head on his mama's shoulder? That's the picture. A child that's content. <laughs> He's just being what God made him to be. It's okay. But when I'm wiggling and squirming and I come to the Lord's table and I'm all out of sorts, I need to remember what the psalmist says. Be still. Be still and quiet yourself like the weaned child that's not pawing for the breast of the mother but content in mama's lap just to be in her presence, just to be held by her. I use that imagery often in my pastoral prayer because I think it's so important for us. That God does bend low and pick us up and he sits us in his lap. He lets us snuggle close and says, just be with me. The older I get and the more people I lose in my life, I realize it's nothing I want from them. It's their presence I miss. In moving, and if any of you got to move in your future, I don't recommend it. <clears throat> It's, it's tough boxing up stuff and trying to get rid of stuff and decide all that stuff. But I came across a little packet of pictures that somebody gave me that a long time ago here, there was a reception. And there were these pictures. And I sat and cried. Because some of them are gone. I don't want them to be back from heaven, and I don't want anything that they have. I would just give anything to hear them all chuckle again. Yeah, I'd love to see Billy and Mary Sue walk down that aisle and take their seat. Don't want nothing. I'd love for my dad to answer the phone and hear the change in his voice when he knew it was me. You see, sometimes we just need to sit in the presence of the Lord and enjoy him. And so we get the chance to do that in a special way as we come to his table. Say, I don't want nothing from you. I'm just trusting you and receiving what you've promised to me. Enjoying being with you and the family. In those pictures, I also noticed there were some who were this tall, and now they're this tall. They were little children, and now they're grown. You go, what happened? That was just yesterday, wasn't it? No. But oh, how precious to share life, to share the presence of people. Have you stilled your heart as you come into the presence of God? And finally, the psalmist says, now that you have grasped this concept, now that you understand this, I want you to know that because of this relationship you have with God, a relationship made possible by Him, then Israel, people of God, put your hope in the Lord. Now and always. These moments don't last forever here, but savor them, cherish them, and put your hope in God. For one day, 
the people of God will gather around the throne of God and they will feast. They will worship and they will praise and they will feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so now we get a foretaste, just a little glimpse. The psalmist says, be still, soak this up, understand that God has done this for you and this is not the end, this is just a reminder of the price Jesus paid and of what is to come when that marriage is consummated in heaven. We are his bride and we will celebrate as never before around his table. Isn't that good? Oh, that's good. Not because we're good, but because he is and our hope is in him. Like I tell you, don't, don't look to me. I'll mess up. I fall. I just try to keep pointing to him because he won't. And you, like that child, can come and sit on his lap. Let him love on you. And remember, it's because he loved us and sent his son. And his son gave his life that we could enjoy that kind of fellowship. Praise be unto God. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can call you Father, sit in your lap, be still, and enjoy you because you have paid it all for us in Christ. Feed our souls, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If the elders will come.
Let's pray. Father, where do we begin to thank you for such a great salvation that's ours in Christ Jesus? It's like one of the Puritans wrote that, oh, how you touch our lives in so many ways and different times, but when you meet with us around your table of Holy Communion, you kiss your church. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so. And may we rise to leave this place committed anew to love you, to walk with you, to serve you, to love your church, to love others, because you loved us first, and you still do. Amen. Since they sang a hymn and they left, our closing hymn is hymn number 198. Hymn number 198, let's stand together as we sing the first and last stanzas, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Receive now the benediction. <clears throat> and now to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and forever. Amen. <clears throat>